Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure most of us met Russell last night. Russell Engel, of course, uh, the 2005 winner of the V8 Supercar Championship. He's been runner-up to that competition four times. He is two times Bathurst winner with Larry Perkins, but he's more than that, as you'll see right now.
few good dudes who are actually on the on the trigger there can actually race a car on a slot car track pretty good anyway. So uh, it was good to see. And uh, yeah, like I said, we'll, uh, we'll go through a couple of things. I've got a, got a couple of cool things to show you as well along the way. Um, first up, uh, a lot of these sort of events, you know, they get the motivational speaker up and it's all about, you know, jam up and, and uh, always makes me a bit laugh when I see the, the celebrity, you know, you get the um, a rock star or the movie star and they go, you know, what advice have you got for all your fans? And they go, I oh, oh, just live your dreams. Seriously, just live your dreams. If we wanted to live our dreams, we'd be on a hundred foot yacht off the coast of Greece somewhere floating around. But dreams and reality, uh, I find it are two completely different things. So let's work on the reality side of it. So what, what I find with sport, sport is very similar to, to business. And a lot of things that I pick up in the sport arena, which have motivated me to you know, win championships and, and win Bathurst, uh, there's a couple of little key elements there and the things that I've always got in the back of my head when, say for instance, um, the number one was sitting on the grid of a race. So you, say you're sitting on the grid of a race at Bathurst, biggest sporting event, I was going to say in Australia and New Zealand, but probably the world, it is a world renowned race. And I'd always listen, you'd be sitting there jeeing yourself up and you'd always uh, listen to some of the interviews. So reporters are going around, interviewing everyone and going, you know, how do you think you're going to go and um, how's your race going to go? And they use the word hope. I hope I'm going to go well this weekend or um, I, with a bit of luck, the car is set up correct. As soon as I heard those two words, I'm going to beat you. I've got you number straight away. As soon as the word hope and luck, and a lot of people do use it in, in general life to me, Number one, you make your own luck. You've got to make it happen for you. There's no doubt about that. And then on the racetrack, you've got to make it happen. And if you're using the word hope, you're not confident enough in your own ability. So to me, that's a really important factor in, in racing, and I think in everyday life, and especially in business. You know, for you guys, I mean, imagine if you're, I won't give an example, wiring up a, a circuit board or a controller or something, you're going, geez, I hope someone turned the electricity off. <laughs> oh, Ah, uh, with a bit of luck, it'll be all right. You know, oh, what happened to Fred? Why does he look like a barbecue on the ground? Yeah, the hope thing didn't work out so well for him. You know, so they're the sort of things, you know, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's a, it was a really strong thing for me that, that I knew I could do it. And the new generation of race drivers, I've just come from Sandown a couple of weeks ago, down in Melbourne, Sandown 500, huge race. And uh, I was, again, listening, because I'm on the Fox side of things now, sort of talking about racing instead of doing it. And uh, they were interviewing a lot of the drivers, and the, the luck and the hope word came up a fair bit. And then there was Cameron Waters, new young gun. He co-drive with Richie Stanaway, who's a really brilliant New Zealand racer that's coming up and comer. Um, and he was on the grid. Um, they were on the front row. And again, in the area, everyone else, yeah, yeah, hope, luck, yeah, I think we're going to go OK. And they interviewed Cam Waters, and he said, yeah, I've got this. You know, I've got it, no problems. And it really stood out, and I thought, geez, that's pretty confident, 24-year-old. You know, he's saying, yeah, there was no hesitation, I've got this. Went out and won the race. Both of them, start to finish, absolutely untouchable, Scott McLaughlin finished second, who's the championship leader, pressured him all the way, didn't crack. But right from the word go, his mindset was, I've got this. And I reckon that was a pretty cool thing, especially at, at such a young age as well. So um, that'll come up in life, I reckon. So just, just have a bit of a think about that one. Um, with your industry, you'd say that knowledge, you, you can't, especially if you've been in the industry for a long time, you're going to say knowledge is a good thing. And, and I reckon the same with motorsport. The more laps you do, the more tracks you go to, the more people you meet along the way, the, the harder the competition. Um, knowledge is a good thing, but I found out later in life, sometimes it also can be a hindrance. And I say that because when I went through my early years, Larry Perkins, I was with seven years. Larry Perkins was brilliant, brilliant engineer. Um, he concentrated more on Bathurst and the championship because Bathurst was his track. I ended up winning two Bathurst with Larry. Um, but the knowledge that you got out of it, and I can trust the equipment. I knew when I got in one of his cars, it wasn't going to break down, it was going to be fast. Everyone, his, his whole team structure was absolutely excellent. So I had confidence in the whole deal. 
Same when I changed teams and went to a couple of pretty famous Kiwis, Ross and Jimmy Stay and the Stone Brothers Racing in a Falcon. Ended up winning the championship in 2005 with them. You just, all you had to do was concentrate on the racing because you knew the equipment was good. And later down the road, changed teams again and went, went through a couple of various different stages of Paul Morris Motorsport and then went to Wildcanshaw Racing, the Holden Dealer team and ran the Super Jet Commodore out of there. And we had a pretty rough year and, and that was a game changer. Everything's great, the world's a great place while things are going really well and you've got really good equipment. And then you have a couple of bad years. Again, I always refer it to business, you know, not everything, not every year is going to be a burst of year, you know, you're going to have your ups and downs. And when it was down, you know, I almost started wanting to run the whole thing myself. So I jumped in the race car, um, I was doing the strategy over the radio because we can talk back to the pits. And I was starting to take control. When I was back in the pits, I was telling the engineer how we should set the car up. And, it, it, and we had a really, really average year in, in considering I probably never finished outside the top six for most of my career. And I think I finished 11th in the championship that year, which was, for my results, I thought was a pretty bad year. And the funny bit thing about it is, is, he, is a young engineer came up to me and pulled me to one side and said, Russell, I know you. I know you're really experienced, you've got a lot of knowledge, and you know the sport inside now, but seriously, you've got to step back because there's a bunch of guys around you, you've got this team around you, they know what they're doing. Yes, they're going to make mistakes along the way, but you've got to let them make a mistake to learn. As long as they learn, you go, yeah, okay. And I sort of, at, initially I had half a go at him, crack at him, so I, I know what I'm doing, you know, I've been around this game long enough as we probably all do, you know, I don't know whether you're solo runners or you've got a couple of people that are, do actually work for you. And you've got to sort of pull back and after I thought about it, I thought, yeah, actually, I'm, he's probably right, you know, that I've got to actually step back, let them do their job, let it all, all about teamwork, let them do it, and if they make a mistake, just go, hey, okay, bit of encouragement, so just don't do it again, but, you know, at least you learn from it. So. Those, those two things are probably the biggest things in my career that have really stood out and I think that's, again, I, I take it over into my business life and other things that I do in life. I, I do a little bit of motor racing then, but um, I, I, you know, one of these days you'll probably, if you think about back to this conference, you'll think, oh, yeah, maybe Russell was right on that one. But, and again, as we get older, we get less trusted, but I think we've got to reverse it sometimes. Let people sometimes trip over and then pick them back up, dust them off and let them go at it. So they're the two biggest things. now. I want, to, I want to show you, we're talking about teamwork, this is a really cool video because the next one that I'm going to show you is Alan Moffat uh, and Peg Hagen, they, they shared a color, this was a 73 GT Falcon, now it's a pit stop back then and then also a current pit stop which actually my old mate Mark Scaife uh, and Mark Cambro is a pretty successful uh, Tasmanian driver. And those two, um, we talk about teamwork and the difference has changed since 1973 to the current day in pit stops. And just have a look at some of the goings on in the Moffat era. And, and I love Alan Moffat, I reckon, because he always wore the black hat. That's, that's what I modelled myself off. I didn't mind getting a bit angry and wore the black hat. And uh, it's really cool. So if we, if we roll that one, check it out. Seven, they're already putting the fuel in the back and he's only been in six seconds. Alan Moffat snuffed up, doesn't appear to be going to get out of the car. Apropos what you were talking before, Freddie Gibson's trying to check things over with him inside there. He's calling for some refreshments. It's a can of Coca-Cola, of course. Uh, the petrol's going in the back. I've got the foot on the can to stop it from rolling out into the track. We need to do something good down there, guys. That's right, yeah. They found a use for me at last. Um, He's calling for a cloth to wipe his face with and that there's a tremendous sense of urgency here in this uh, pit stop and they're only been in now for 40 seconds as at this moment. Uh, the engine's only getting a fairly cursory trying to look at there. They're, they're just putting a little bit of oil in it, just giving a bit of a, a, a bit of a quick check. He's gone for another can. It doesn't mean that he, uh, that he drank all the first one. He simply uh, lost most of it in the overspray. So uh, they're wiping the windscreen uh, in the back of the car there. The uh, pit crew are standing there with these large uh, quick fill containers of petrol ready to put in as soon as one comes out. Uh, we'll try and get you a shot of the tank there later on, but uh, they've got an enormous, huge, big, uh, a, great, a great big filler there in the back there with a big funnel on it, and that uh, you can see how it catches the petrol and uh, lets it all funnel straight on down there. And right down the bottom of that funnel that you can see there, there is a quick locking device, and all they do is hit it and it's closed, and he is away. And it's been about 1 minute 25 seconds and Alan Moffat is out of the pits again for what may be one of the most important pit stops in the race. Right. And Ambrose goes with him. The two on the limit on the way and look at Marcus almost drills the back of the HRT. 
RT car made huge ground in the braking area. 40 k's is a dollar. And Scape and Ambrose are positioned right at the northern end of the new lane. So they're going to make Scape go the long way, they're not going to let him go through. And now the reason for that is they've got their own car to deal with. Scape almost followed, went the wrong way then. That might have lost him. Gonna jump in, no, side by side, Scape, wow, what an exit. through the window, like you want to rehydrate, it's probably like about 45 degrees inside of that old XA Falcon, so we'll just bowl a can of Coke in there spilling on the ground. <laughs> I tell you, what a change. And uh, again, like your business, um, I was listening to a couple of the speakers before, how it's changed over the years and progressing. Have, have a look at that. It was that minute 30 pit stop compared to that was probably uh, probably 12 seconds. And but that's the sort of thing nowadays you have to do. Like you have to do pit stops that quick. I know there was a tyre stop that one of the, I think the BJR, Brad Jones Racing's um, at Sandown, and it was like a, a four and a half second tyre stop, which was incredible, considering Formula 1 cars are sort of 2.9 seconds, four and a half, and they've got half the amount of people compared to a Formula 1. They've got three people per wheel on a Formula 1 car. Uh, there's only two on a, on a supercar, so it's just amazing. But uh, it's, really, it's really cool footage when you look back and, and see where the sport's gone and where it's come from and all the rest of it. Um, but the other question I get answered, uh, asked quite a bit is what makes, we obviously got the race car and the teams build, uh, whether it be a Ford, Holden or Nissan, and they're the three brands that are in supercars at the moment. But what, what makes a, a winning car uh, and, and why is one driver better than the others? It's a really hard thing to sort of explain. It's not a, it's more of a visual thing, more so than a, you know, a lot of it comes with the experience and the rest of it. But there is techniques to a driver that can do it, you know, like a Scott McLaughlin or a Jamie Winkup, or to the guys that can't get to that level. And like I said, it's all technique. So I come up with this bit of an idea to have a visual, right? So to have this visual, I need a couple of volunteers. Now the volunteers have been selected and I trust that they're the right people because it's going to get ugly, all right? So, uh, rightio, Tom Humphreys Glenn. Where's Tom? Is Tom kicking yeah. around? Come on down. Hello, Tom. Come on down, Tom. Which is good. Yep, step up here, mate. Step. This, this is going to be a pit area, so jump in the pits. Don't use the stairs, it's all right. Uh, rightio, now we've always got to have a female because we all know females are better drivers than men. All right. Uh, Trudy McAlay, is that right? Did I say it right, Trudy? Pretty close, come on Trudy. You better be have a bit of grunt, Trudy, because like I said, this, this could get right. I'm pretty sure you're a bit of a petrol head, Trudy, too. All right. Sit in our pit bay, all right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna show you a visual of what makes a fast race driver. And, and a lot of this translates to everyday driving too, so pay attention, there's a bit of driving experience going on here as well. Righty up, you're up first, you ready? Go, we hooked up here, hello? Yep, we got, come up here, stand up here. Right, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna do a lap of bit switch raceway, because that's a, that's a simple straight Queensland circuit, uh, South McLaughlin had just won there actually, so Kiwi. Do we like Kiwi drivers? So Scott and Glock won the won the race. So, it's only got six turns, alright? Four right handers, two left handers. Uh, top speed of about 246 kilometers an hour, right? So we're gonna do a lap around there and I'm gonna guide you around it, right? But the deal is you've got to be a car first. So we've got three cars, we've got Holden, Ford, or Nissan, which one you want to be? I'll go You go the Holden? Yeah. Okay, you're a Ford guy, aren't you? Aren't you? Aren't you? Oh, you're Nissan, so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that, you're, you'll get over it. <laughs> so, alright, so we're going to do a lap of the track, right? I'm going to go edge around it. Right. Now, we're going to start on the start line. Thunder off, do one lap over it. Like I said, I'll go edge it. But we've got to have some sound effects going as well. Yeah. Are you going to be good at that? 
Okay. Um, so, and then I'll go through around. So we'll do, do yourself and we'll do Trudy and then see how we go. All right. You ready? Here we go. Your head starts because they do lock, uh, line lock starts, so it's on the rev limiter and then dump the clutch and off we go. So I'll, I'll give you a shove and we go. Ready? <laughs> Ready? Ready, <laughs> <laughs> boy? Okay. <laughs> right. Ready? Okay. I know. Oh, no, you go. No. Right out. Red's coming on. Red's coming on. Red's off green. Go. <laughs> <laughs> now, here go.
the difference between those two, with my input, of course, <laughs> is we got a fantastic lap. Looked great. Most of it was on two wheels, using the curbs, grabbing mm -hmm. dirt, doing everything like that. It looked spectacular, but it was about two seconds off the pace. So if you told that to someone, you go, but hang on, it looked really good. You know, it was aggressive, and the back of the car was out and looked fantastic. That's great. But the truth is, though, everyone would look at that and go, oh, no, that was the slowest lap. So I was sitting from the outside, the car wasn't getting out of shape, and it didn't look fast, and she wasn't using the curbs. But Trudy's lap was faster because she was nice and smooth, didn't upset the attitude of the car. Now, so I've got an example here. Now, this is Scott McLaughlin's lap from the recent Ipswich race. Some really cool in-car stuff that I got off the, uh, off the Fox guys. And that will show you, just look at the attitude and how cool it is. Remember, this is a record-breaking lap here. It's a current record holder now for every trace back. Look at his inputs, how smooth he is, his gear changes, and how unhurried he is. So have a look, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> Ford and 
Bathurst and a Holden, so arguably two of the biggest things you could win in a motorsport career in Australia anyway. Uh, and, I, and I've sort of split down the middle. Um, to be honest, I think I've always, a Holden has suited my driving style better, and that's probably more of the design of the car more so than anything else. So I'll probably, and I, I did a lot more racing in Holden, so I'll probably lean a little bit towards that. Um, but win the championship wasn't that bad, so you've got to have the blue oval kicking around there a little bit. Oh, who we got? Hey Russell, I'm um, just wondering what your thoughts are on the V6 Commodores next year. V6, you're going to get technical on me, aren't you? Well, it's, it's more out of curiosity than yeah, yeah, you know, no, no, no. inside of the sport will disappear with it. You're probably talking to someone that's very biased. Uh, because, <laughs> because I'm old school, I grew up around V8s and, and like everything, you know, we keep, keep referring back to change and uh, you guys know all about change at the moment, it's hard to keep up with it. Uh, hence why you've got this conference to try and keep up with it. And same in supercar land where the motor industry is changing. They're all going smaller capacity engines uh, are producing the same horsepower as big old heavy engines like a V8. Um, so our sports are starting to revolve with the times where in 2019 you will be eligible to run a V6 turbocharged engine and different configurations of that as well. So uh, am I happy about it? No because at the end of the day, like our two drivers up here, who sound, you know, sort of sound like V8s, but they were, you can't get over the sound, you know, and, and to me, sport is, is a, a visual and an audio thing, you know, and you go to a V8 supercar race, and it's one of those sports where you see it on TV, and you think, oh yeah, that's pretty cool, then you go see it live, and because of the noise and everything that goes on, you go, it, everything looks like it's happening twice as fast. So, the noise is part of it, so to me, oh, I wish they'd stick with V8s, to be honest. But I can understand as well, if you want to try and keep manufacturers into it or attract more manufacturers, they want to run current engines. So it's a, it's a real dilemma at the moment. But um, I think change, we've got to accept change. And, uh, that's part of it, you know, like you guys do. You've got to, you've got to accept the change that's coming in the, uh, in the electrical arena, you know, or otherwise you get left behind. So, so that's it. Hey, Russell. Hey, Thanks for coming out. Um, cool. I've got a question about discipline and attitude, like playing at a high level. Like, what did, what are your rituals that you did to make sure you always performed at your best every time? Uh, well, as you said by some of the videos, I wasn't that disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask Mark Scope about that one. I'm going to tell it. Uh, he's got a few stories. Um, yeah, look, I, I, love, I love sports. I encourage my girls to play sports because I think sports, no matter what it is, whether it be tennis or, or footy or whatever it may be, it, it teaches you commitment, discipline, uh, and all the attributes and, and, and relying on your teammates and uh, all those sort of things which I think later in life are very important for, for anyone. Uh, so I, I think sport, because I, I started racing go-karts when I was 12 years old, so I've, I've been racing something with four wheels since 12 years old. So. I think you naturally get into, into a mode of being competitive, uh, but being disciplined too. And what, and what I said before as well about you know, trusting the people around you as well, which is, like I said, later in life is a little bit hard, thing, hard, to, uh, hard to come to grips with because as um, that story I was telling you about you know, trusting your team around you, your name is on the side of the door. You know, and that's what I reminded this guy about once. You know, I said, yeah, it's good, but if you don't do your job properly, my name's on the side of the car, and I'm the one that looks like a deal. You know, it's your name on, the, on your business card. If one of your employees lets you down, share this copper more than anything. So, um, I think that was always incentive to always be a bit broader. In discipline's one thing, but being broad in your discipline as well, and, and uh, not being too stubborn and pig-headed, which I've been guilty of now and then. But you know, you never stop learning. I can tell you, but. Uh, uh, yeah, there's your life lessons. Hi, hey, my question is, how do you know when you're going fast enough? Uh, well, you look at the time sheet. <laughs> That's a pretty good indication. Um, it is, motorsport's uh, a weird thing over, over any other sport where you, you've got a, a big, heavy car around, especially a supercar. You know, they weigh 1,350 kilos still. They've got, like I said, just under 700 horsepower. Um, and you've got to feel the grip in the car, so, and it's a really fine edge because the difference between taking it to the limit 
and then going two and a half percent over and you fire in the fence. There's not much leeway there. Um, so you got to get a feel for it and I think that's it only comes from experience and knowing your machinery as well. So um, you know that you've got to find the limit of the machinery very early and then you've got to work with all your team and your engineers to get push that bit further. Um, but it is car limited and that's where motorsport is a little bit unfair and, and I take Formula One for instance that um, Formula One, unless you're in a Ferrari, uh, a, a Red Bull or, or a Mercedes, you're not going to win a race. And to me that would be really deflating, you know, that if you're in one of those other teams, you know, you're fighting at a good day for last position on the podium, which, which is unfortunately is machine orientated and uh, that's why I like to think with supercars that it is probably skewed a little bit more towards driver, you know, driver's ability, and that's to me what, what makes sport, but it's about it's about the individual, you know, more so than the machinery. So um, supercars are a bit like that. And, uh, yeah, but speed is, is just all about having that feel, you know, pushing it to the edge, and if you have to go over it, go over it, but keep it on the black stuff, because putting it on the green stuff isn't very good. They don't handle too well in the grass, I can tell you. Well, one more question, yeah, I think, yeah. from the back. Yeah. Hey, Rusty. Hey, mate. After you cruelly stated that Holden was your preference, I had a <laughs> chat here, like, <laughs> here last night. Tell us about what's in your garage with two doors. Uh, yeah, I can't. Jeez, you cornered me, haven't you? <laughs> 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 I'm wrong. <probably. laughs> uh, yes, I do have a Ford in the garage. Um, there is, a re there is a reason because I like freebies, all right, so just any supplier. <laughs> any supplier out there, all right, I do like freebies and respond very well to them. But uh, yes, I do have a, have a Mustang, um, but I'm going back to that, that V8 thing. Um, I, I can't, uh, um, I was always thinking about a Commodore, but the thing is um, Peugeot has now bought Holden and I can't cop it that I'm going to have a French no, no offence to be <laughs> 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 very, very careful really. But um, uh, Peugeot Bill Commodore, I'm not so sure of, you know, and especially a six cylinder. So uh, yeah, I've got a two door Mustang which I've done a fair bit of work to. I've got some friends out of Melbourne that threw some kit at it, the supercharger and all the rest of it, so it's actually got more horsepower than a supercar. Uh, and, it's, and it's fairly insane. So uh, yes, you're right. So you have cornered me, and I've got a Ford in the garage. So, <laughs> sorry, but there will be a hole in there soon too. I think I think, I'm, I think I might park one of those Commodores. I reckon it might be a good superannuation plan. So uh, remembering, unfortunately, the hole is closing down next year, which will be a very sad day in history. I think of um, not only motorsport but the motor industry as well. That we're going to lose uh, one of the great manufacturers in, in Holden too, which is a bit of a sad day. But uh, anyway, as I say, that's progress. Probably not good in that respect. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. we have no more time for questions, but I think you join, uh, agree with me. Not only is a fantastic championship driver, he's also a great guy. Would you please I really thank Mr. Russell?